Today in our services, we've been trying to have a look at the topic of hospitality and where it all fits into our faith. And um, you'll have heard that theme coming through both of those readings, the Isaiah reading uh, about uh, what God is really looking for uh, in terms of justice, and that involves sharing the sharing of food, uh, which in those days was probably pretty scarce um, uh, on many occasions, and that uh, it was the people of God's job to make sure that they didn't just hoard that to themselves, but that they shared it with others. In the uh, reading that Martin's just read to us, there's the command to practice hospitality um, in the Christian church. And uh, again, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. It's coupled with how you treat your enemy because many of these early Christian churches were subject to persecution. Um, and so, you know, again, if you had food, it's not the kind of thing that you'd naturally feel you should share with your enemy. But that was what Christians were placed under some kind of obligation to do. And of course, they'd inherited that from the Jewish tradition where there were laws about hospitality and the treatment of strangers. But I thought where I'd start this evening is actually with uh, a story, uh, a true story, a story from my own life about how uh, one particular person had a, a, a sort of an inspiring effect on me through uh, the, the practice of hospitality. And it, it goes back many years to when I was at university in Exeter in the 1970s. One of the people I met <coughs> um, while I was at university was, was a businessman uh, called Brian, who, um, I forgave him the name, by the way, um, but a businessman called Brian, he, he, was, he was a relative of um, Dr. Helen Rosevear, who some of you may have heard of. She wrote a number of books in the 1970s about her experience as a missionary in the Congo, which even in those days was a very violent and unpleasant place. And she had had some pretty horrible experiences um, trying to bring the gospel to, uh, to the indigenous people there. Um, and, and so um, he, he'd become quite well known by association. And sometimes Christian students would congregate in his house um, on, on Friday evenings. And um, <clears throat> very often, uh, well, there was, there was food to be had there, which is probably why these Christian students congregated there. But I remember these meetings uh, that, that really they consisted of not much more than Brian just talking to us, you know, about certain experiences that he'd had and uh, the experiences of his cousin, Dr. Helen, who um, had had these experiences and written books about it. But uh, <clears throat> over some months, I, I got to know him quite well. And <clears throat> on Monday lunch times, he began to invite me and several others to join him in the cafe at the Northcott Theatre in Exeter, which you can still go to if you want to. And <clears throat> so... Um, uh, we, we would turn up, and it, it must have looked pretty unusual, actually, this sort of swish businessman in his suit and sort of very well turned out, sitting around this table with five or six of the great unwashed, uh, just talking about life. And, you know, we would go along, and he would, he would actually pay for our meals. We didn't have to pay for them at all. He'd never accept any money from us. And we would just sit down around this table and he'd ask us about, you know, what church had been like the previous day, the messages that we'd heard, um, and would ask us questions about what was going on in our lives. And 
And sometimes we would start to have discussions about some quite deep things about theology and, you know, usually arising from whether we agreed with the preacher the day before, which often we didn't. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and he would also begin to talk about his life with a level of, of very radical honesty that at the time I, I found very, very unusual. I'd never kind of experienced that kind of thing in my family or even in any of the churches that I'd been to. And this actually continued for quite a long time and sometimes different people would join us and sometimes uh, one or two occasions where the people who joined us for lunch on Mondays were really quite um, sort of well, very unexpected, people in very considerable need, you know, people who were in a lot of trouble of some kind or were suffering from mental health problems. And we would just be expected to sit down and, and they would be fed as well as us and we would get to know them and talk to them. Now, the reason I'm telling you that story is that looking back on it now, I would say that my own experience as a disciple of Jesus Christ was formed more fully around those Monday lunchtime tables than I think it ever was in the church that I went to at the time. I learned more about what it meant to be a follower of Jesus through these pieces of table fellowship than ever I did from sermons in church or home groups or the places where you would expect that you'd learn those things. And I can still remember some of these encounters very vividly now, although it's more years on than I care to count. Now, I find that quite interesting because... It, it, I, I think I can understand much more readily now what was going on in so many gospel stories where you find Jesus talking to his disciples, but actually the context of this talk was sitting around a table in somebody's house. You know, it starts, well, Jesus was eating in a certain Pharisee's house when? You know, someone came in or there was someone there who needed to be healed and Jesus was able to heal them. Or, you know, he makes some kind of teaching point that he hasn't made at another time. And if you go through the Gospels and, and actually count these occasions, there's a very, very large number of them. And it seems that, that what this Brian was doing with us was trying to sort of recreate this Jesus context where we would be learning and I suppose over the years I've thought you know, has, has the church missed a trick here you know we think that teaching and discipleship goes on mostly in in teaching in church, in sermons or in home groups or in Bible studies, when perhaps those are not quite the context that Jesus had in mind for learning. And so, if we're going to recreate that context and build the kind of disciples that we really want to see or to be ourselves. You know, we have to think about this issue of hospitality. There was a man, you know, who was prepared to, uh, to meet the cost of all of that and uh, to actually give up both his time and his money to create this context for learning. And if, you know, if you, you asked him why he did it, of course, he'd probably say that he got much more out of it than we ever did. Um, I don't know. I'd have to sort of ask him that question. But 
he was, he was doing something at the time that I personally found unique. Now, <clears throat> that leads me to ask the question, how do we recreate something like that in the context of our church activities? Because... <clears throat> For obvious reasons, we associate hospitality with food. And it's quite right that we do so. But I think that hospitality goes further than that. And whilst it often does have food associated with it, it's rather more than that. And uh, we need to think about those things too. The word hospitality in the Greek, in the New Testament, uh, is the word philoxenia, um, <clears throat> which is made up of two words, uh, philos, which means love, and xenia, is, um, it, it's the same root word as we get xenophobia from. It's about strangers. Xenophobia means hatred of strangers, of course. It's not that. But, <clears throat> uh, so philoxenia, hospitality, love for strangers. So it's not just about um, sharing your food with your best mate, okay? It's about strangers. It goes far beyond that. And so <clears throat> um, we need to think about how we ourselves love strangers or those on the outside, those who are not in our immediate circle, those who are not our immediate neighbors. Do I think that hospitality is a gift which some people have or a gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, yes, I think it is. I think there are some Christians who are particularly gifted with that and my friend Brian, I think, was almost certainly one of them. Um, and, you know, he had the lifestyle and the resources to be able to do that. And I guess that some of you could probably think about people who you've known who you think may have a very particularly uh, outstanding gift in that way. But having said that, I don't think that excuses any of us from thinking about this quite deeply. I think we probably ought to think about it in the same way that we think about, shall we say, evangelism. I think that there are some people in the church who are particularly gifted at evangelism. They can do it very naturally. It seems to be second nature to them. Most of us, on the other hand, struggle with it. And we know that we ought to be doing it, um, and we perhaps put a lot of effort into it sometimes and feel that we don't get very far. And I think that it is rather like that, um, that, that there are some people who seem to do hospitality very naturally, uh, um, but for some of us it's a bit of a struggle. We don't feel that it's within our particular remit to do, uh, but we still need to get involved with it. We can't leave it aside because of what I have been saying about how basic it is to discipleship uh, in the Gospels. Um, <clears throat> And so we need to carry on thinking about how we do this as groups of people and possibly as individuals too. Hospitality, I think, in the New Testament doesn't begin so much with food as it does with talking receiving a stranger into your sphere of experience, reaching out to someone who's on the outside of your group of friends, starting to talk to someone who perhaps otherwise you might ignore. I don't know whether, I, I mentioned this this morning, but I don't know whether any of you have seen the latest advert on TV um, by the Samaritans. If you, you, you may not have, um, perhaps I'm suffering from only watching late night TV. 
Um, <clears throat> but it just it begins with uh, this woman who seems to be um, always buying ice cream cones, um, just going up to somebody she happens to meet and saying to them, isn't it a lovely day today? And after one or two very ordinary examples of saying to somebody, isn't it a lovely day today? And sometimes getting a response and not getting very much. You see a picture of a man standing at the end of a railway platform on his own. And she goes up to him with her ice cream and says, isn't that a lovely day today? And he just turns and looks. And she says to him, are you all right? The point being that he's not all right at all. The reason why he's standing there is that he's about to chuck himself in front of a train and to end it all. And as a result of her going up to him and saying, isn't it a lovely day today? Someone else is actually able to come along and to save his life, in effect. And the point that the Samaritans are trying to make in this advert is that if you just ignore people, and you, know, and you sometimes just don't just start these conversations and start to kind of include them in what you're doing, um, the, the consequences really can be quite serious. Now, they're, they're making that point because they have a particular agenda. But I found this advert very interesting about the power of sometimes just taking people into your sphere of activity through something as simple as starting a conversation and how that's perhaps where hospitality begins. Love of strangers, okay? reaching out where sometimes the temptation is not to do so at all. And actually, that means that whether or not we think we're great at hospitality in terms of welcoming people into our homes, actually, we can start where we are with something as simple as starting a conversation. And that kind of hospitality is accessible to every one of us. The problem that sometimes we've had in the church when we think about hospitality is that the first thing that we think about is the dinner party. You know, the dinner party is way down the road. You know, that's the Rolls Royce stuff. It doesn't begin there. You know, all Christians are told by St. Paul in Romans 12 to practice hospitality. He doesn't mean throwing a dinner party. He's talking about just reaching out to receive strangers into your sphere of influence or whatever you want to call it, into your space. Just being friendly, which is something that a few Christians might want to think about. So the starting point in all of this is, is often just the question, well, what can I manage? You know, because the starting point for hospitality is very simple, how far can I go? And do I do that? Because the answer to that is usually, well, sometimes. And perhaps, since today is also the first Sunday of Lent, we could do a lot worse than thinking about whether this could be part of our Lent efforts and our Lent discipline. Just stepping out to be a bit more friendly to someone who might be to us a stranger or someone on the outside of things. Drawing things together, maybe, you know, inviting someone we haven't talked to for a long time for a, a coffee and a slice of cake in one of the local cafes, of which there are many, so there's lots of opportunity. Sharing a meal with someone, if you can, yes, but it's not possible for all of us, and God knows that. Start where we are, but let's make sure that we do do it, as part, perhaps as part of this Lent, and that it becomes 
the kind of habit that allows us to grow in discipleship and in the following of Jesus.